All right, good evening, everyone. So this is chapter 11, personality from the psychology second edition um, by OpenStax. All right, so let's talk about what personality is. Um, this is actually a really cool chapter. There's lots of uh, theories that we're gonna explore and, um, uh, and I hope you enjoy this. So personality is, the definition is longstanding traits and patterns that prepare individuals uh, consistently to think, feel, behave, and act in certain ways. So when you think about personality, like, ooh, what's my personality? Um, asking yourself, how would you describe your personality? What changes have happened along the way, if any, right? Um, so these are, these are things we can do for self-assessment. Self but the word personality comes from the Latin word persona, uh, which was a mask that was worn by an actor. And um, they used to use masks to basically um, represent or project a specific personality trait. So you'll see here these masks, there's happy. Um, well, some of these, that looks a little frightened, um, curious, shy. Uh, so, yeah, so what characteristics describe your personality? So humans have been thinking about personality for a very long time. Um, so some uh, historical perspective. So Hippocrates from 370 before the common era BCE, um, he theorized that personality traits and human behaviors were based on four separate temperaments that he associated with the four uh, with four fluids called humors of the body. So um, first one is caloric, which is yellow bile from the liver. Then there's uh, melancholic, and you can still right. So you probably hear melancholy today. That's still a word that we use. Um, that was black bile from the kidneys. Uh, sanguine, which is uh, red blood from the heart and phlegmatic, which is the white phlegm from, from our lungs. So that was Hippocrates. And then along came Galen, and he believed that both diseases and personality differences could be explained by imbalances uh, in the fluids that were described. And he's basically using the same, um, uh, the same descriptors as Hippocrates did, right? Caloric, melancholic sanguine and, and phlegmatic, um, but he assigned temperaments. So if you were caloric, uh, which is the yellow bile from the liver, then you were passionate, you were ambitious, you would be described as being bold. If you were melancholic, which is the black bile from the um, kidneys, you would be reserved, anxious, um, unhappy, sanguine, right? Um, red blood from the heart, uh, you'd be described, or that would be described as being eager, optimistic, cheerful, joyful. And then finally, phlegmatic, um, which is the white phlegm from the lungs, uh, you'd be considered calm, reliable, you're thoughtful, right? By responsible, you could be counted on. Uh, so th that's some of the historical perspectives. Obviously, we really don't uh, don't really use that, uh, but it is interesting that melancholy has kind of hung on. Then there was also um, <coughs> in the Victorian age, and we've talked about the Victorian age too. Very sexually repressed. Um, there was a lot of uh, what they call pseudosciences happening at the time. And um, one of them was the idea of phrenology. Um, and actually, I'm going to show you a video of it here in just a second that talks about it. But what they believed was is that a chart of the area of your skull um, would correspond to certain personality traits. So they'd feel your head. And depending on the lumps that were in your skull, you were determined to have certain personality traits or characteristics, right? Uh, so that was phrenology, um, AKA pseudoscience. Uh, every once in a while, you can still find um, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, phrenology um, skull, and you can see how they're how it's labeled in there. Um, well, let's go ahead and watch this uh, video here. It talks about phrenology and. A lot of exciting neuroscience was happening in 19th century England. Victorian scientists were figuring out that certain parts of our brains are connected with certain parts of our bodies, like different senses or muscles. But mixed in with the legitimate research was some pseudoscience, or misleading ideas that spread without rigorous scientific backing. Like one theory from Viennese physician Franz Joseph Gall, who thought that character traits, like religiousness or curiosity, were also linked to specific brain regions. This theory became the basis of phrenology, a field of study that claimed that you could determine someone's personality by the shape of their skull. Phrenologists believed that all human brains were made up of many distinct organs that could be mapped to various personality traits. They claimed that the more you used a certain brain region, the bigger it got, and the less you used it, the smaller it got, kind of like how muscles work. And they assumed that the skull conformed to the shape of the brain, revealing where these bigger and smaller organs were. So theoretically, you could inspect someone's skull to figure out parts of their personality. Phrenology became enormously popular in the UK around the early 1800s and spread to places like America, France, and Germany. It was pretty much a load of garbage and guesswork, and many scientists were vocal critics. But at the time, there wasn't enough evidence to thoroughly debunk the theory. Researchers would, of course, dissect the brains of dead people, not living people, and the human body changes a lot after death. So even if living brains were different shapes, dead brains probably looked pretty much the same. Plus, the public thought phrenology was really compelling, just like horoscopes, people tend to love things that tell them something about themselves. So phrenology thrived on subjective validation, which is the idea that people tend to believe in something if it's personally true or meaningful for them. But as the ideas spread, they started being used to justify race and class inequalities. Upper classes used phrenology to reassure themselves that they were supposed to be on top because of the ideal shapes of their brains. The lower classes, on the other hand, accepted the pseudoscience because it claimed that these brain organs could be developed so they could improve themselves with hard work. The American physician Samuel Morton made even more sweeping claims about skull shape in a book, Crania Americana. Morton argued that Caucasians were superior to other races like Africans and Native Americans because of craniometry, or different skull and supposedly brain sizes. Which is just racism under the guise of science. Some phrenologists used these ideas to rationalize slavery and colonization, while others were anti-slavery because they thought these inferior races ought to be protected. Eventually, all of this scientific racism was acknowledged, and phrenology's legitimacy took a nosedive in the mid-1800s as we continue to learn more about how the human brain actually works. First of all, the brain conforms to the shape of the skull, not the other way around. And secondly, the brain does not physically grow or shrink like our muscles. Phrenologists were also wrong that the brain was made up of discrete chunks. It's one organ with a bunch of networked cells. But there was something to the idea that the brain was spatial organized, and different regions were linked with different functions, which we call functional specialization. The French physician Paul Broca contributed some evidence to support this idea in the 1860s. He found that damage to the left frontal lobe in humans was linked to speech impairment without affecting someone's ability to understand what other people were saying. In the 1870s, Gustav Fritsch and J. L. Hitzig were experimenting with stimulating different parts of the cerebral cortex of a dog, which produced movement in different areas of its body. Through experiments like these, scientists were able to develop a better understanding of different regions of the brain by the start of the 20th century. Unlike phrenological maps, which assigned arbitrary brain areas to personality traits, our current brain maps are based on experiments that show different functions of each region. With the development of technologies like magnetic resonance imaging and computed tomography, and the ability to do careful brain surgery, our understanding of neuroscience continues to grow. Nowadays, we are positive that phrenology was junk science. The shape of someone's head doesn't say anything about their personality, character, or moral depth. But we can still see its echoes in language we use today, like highbrow, lowbrow, and well-rounded. Phrenology may have lacked scientific merit, and was definitely used to justify harmful ideas, but it did cause scientists to think more critically about how biology is intertwined with thoughts and emotions. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow, brought to you by our patrons on Patreon. Now, how that works is we ask for your money, so that we don't have to charge you. That's the idea of Patreon. Also, we give... And I will dispense with the commercial.
although they might come back and say that I have a copyright violation, but it's all good. All right, that's, um, yeah, so uh, just kind of touching back on, on the phrenology and measuring people's heads. And that actually, if you think about what happened in uh, like Nazi Germany, they were still doing that um, to justify um, the treatment of Jews and gypsies and, and um, what they consider to be non-Aryan uh, individuals. So um, mid 1800s may seem like ancient history, mid 1900s still kind of Kind of, still kind of hanging around. And as he pointed out, low brow, high brow, well-rounded. So if you, had a, if you have a well-rounded skull, uh, you are superior, right? According to that um, uh, phrenologist. So, um, so some other uh, uh, historical perspectives, sorry. Um, one was Emmanuel Gant, or Kant, I should say. Um, agreed with Galen that individuals could be organized into four temperaments. And so, um, and then he delivered, well, this is what he did. He did it, um, uh, sorry, Wernicke's area and the Broca's area are fighting with each other again. Developed a list of traits to describe each personality in the four temperaments. And so this is from your book. Um, and so this would be, uh, ooh, let me turn on my laser pointer. Uh, so, right, so melancholic, we kind of talked about this before. Um, anxious, worried, right? So it's kind of broken down into each of these. And then Wilhelm Wundt, Wundt um, if you'll recall from chapter one intro, and he was the first person to have an actual lab in Germany. Um, he suggested that personality could be described using two major axes. Um, one is non-emotional versus emotional, and then changeable versus unchangeable. Um, and you can also see that uh, in this diagram as well. So you have strong emotions here at the top, right? Weak emotions at the bottom. So this would be the emotional, non-emotional, and then unchangeable versus changeable. So the more they went into these directions, right, in these quadrants. <coughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. And then I gotta look at the time. Okay. Uh, psychodynamic perspectives. Uh, Sigmund Freud, he's popping up again. Um, and Neo-Freudians, and here's one of the things, so, so Sigmund Freud, he's, he's considered like the father of modern psychology, right? Um, we, we still talk about Freud, um, even, even though some of his theories are really not um, anymore, uh, there's, there's no credence to, to, to some of them. Um, but there are things that he did that we still use today, and we're gonna be talking about that, like with defense mechanisms, um, etc. Um, but if you'll recall, and we're going to hit it again, um, probably on Wednesday, because I don't think we'll have time to get all the way into it tonight. But he was the one that developed the um, psychosexual uh, stages of development, right? And he proposed that unconscious drives influenced um, our, our sex drive, aggression, um, and that all of this influenced our personality as adults. And he really was the first one to, to try to come up with a comprehensive theory of personality. And, and we were introduced to that in a previous chapter and we're reviewing it again in this chapter. Now, Neo-Freudians, um, these were the individuals that came after Freud and they, they liked a lot of his theories, but what they did was they're like, no, it's less emphasis on sex. It's really not all about, you know, um, the son wanting to own his mother, or, you know, or conquer his mother or whatever, right? Um, they really focused on um, the environments and the effects of culture on personality. So they didn't agree with the sex. So that's the major difference between 
Sigmund Freud and neo-Freudians is the less emphasis on sex. Um, but they both agreed that child experiences do matter, right? So Freud thought that and the neo-Freudians also thought that. So Freud also talked about levels of consciousness, uh, defense mechanisms, and of course, you know, we were just talking about stages of psychosocial development. And so his levels of consciousness um, is very often uh, depicted as an iceberg. And you'll see here we have uh, what's above the waterline is what's considered conscience. Uh, and unconscious is below the um, waterline. And then what we have on the iceberg itself is the, uh, the id, which is completely submerged in the unconscious the ego, which is partially submerged, right? So there's conscious and unconscious aspects to it. And then the super ego. And his, his idea was, is that we were only aware um, of a small amount of what our mind's activities were. And the rest of it, 90% of it was really hidden from us. And within there would be, um, uh, unconscious or uh, unacceptable urges um, that we may be experiencing. Um, <clears throat> and he also believed that all of this affected our behavior, even though we're not aware of it. Uh, one of his famous um, things that we still say today, um, I bet you you've heard it probably recently about Freudian slips. And what a Freudian slip is, is that that slip of the tongue is saying a word that you did not intend to say, um, but are usually connected with uh, sexual or uh, aggressive urges that is slipping out of the unconscious. So I say something, it's a Freudian slip, and what that's indicating is, is that that's what's really going on in my mind, in my unconscious. So the id, the ego, and the superego, uh, I will say this, uh, this may say it on a, on a, on a future slide. Um, the id, ego, and superego, his ideas of the um, unconscious mind really are not testable and are pretty much like fallen out of favor. There's no real way to test this stuff, right? Um, but he basically posited that personality traits result from the balances of two competing forces, right? So the one is our biological, um, aggressive, our pleasure-seeking drives. And then uh, the internal or socialized control over these pleasure-seeking drives. And so he described the id as containing our primitive urges, um, hunger, thirst, uh, sex, that kind of stuff. Um, he described them as being instinctual, like, and impulsive, like we just need to do that. And that it, the id basically operates on um, the pleasure principle or instant gratification or immediate gratification. Um, so if you recall the, like the marshmallow experiment, right? Um, if, if Freud was looking at that, he would say that the, that the kids that couldn't wait for the second marshmallow we're succumbing to their id, right? The pleasure principle, I want it, I want it now. The superego is what develops through interactions with others. This is how we learn social rules. This is how we determine and learn what's right, what's wrong, how to behave. Um, it's supposed to be our moral compass. Um, and it also strives for um, uh, perfection and it judges behaviors which can lead to feelings of pride or guilt. And then finally, the ego, which is the self, attempts to balance the id with the superego. I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, the id with the superego. Um, it's, the ego is supposed to be rational um, and it operates on what's known as the reality principle. So the way things really are, um, trying to be realistic. And this is the part of personality that others can see. 
So your ego is what is showing. So this is another graphical one. So you have the id, and this is what I described earlier is I want it now, operates on the pleasure principle. And then the superego, which is, you know, where we learn what's right, what's wrong, social rules, um, it's not right to do that. And then the ego, which is the rational part um, that tries to moderate between the two, um, maybe making a statement such as, maybe we can compromise. And let's see here. Let's see how, let me see how long this, I think it's six minutes. So I'll show this video and then, um, uh, and then we'll come back together and go from there. Wait a second, I'll turn off the pen, otherwise the pointer doesn't work. Hello and welcome to today's episode of The Drawing Board. My name is David Franklin and I'm your host and thank you so much for joining us for our 30-day YouTube Tesseract Dice campaign where for 30 days we're talking about the science behind our Tesseract Dice on Kickstarter. And today we're going to be continuing talking about some scientists, talking about Sigmund Freud, the popular psychologist, and answering the question, what are defense mechanisms? Sigmund Freud is considered the father of modern psychology. However, a lot of his theories have been widely discredited as only partially true or not true at all. However, there are a lot of things that still hold some sort of value like defense mechanisms and his idea of the id, super ego, and ego, and we're gonna talk about that today. Now, all defense mechanisms have something to do with the id, super ego, and ego, so we're gonna start by talking about them. The id is the unconscious reservoir of the libido and the psychic energy that fuels instincts and the psychic process. It's rather selfish and pleasure oriented, kind of like a kid and has no ability to delay gratification. The superego contains internal societal idea of good. This is basically your moral beliefs that differentiate between good and bad and right and wrong. Now, both the id and the superego exist in your mind at the same time, and so does the ego. And all of them are sort of fighting and vying for attention and affecting the way that you think and feel. And the ego acts as a moderator between the pleasure-seeking id and the moral-seeking superego and seeks to find a compromise that pacifies both. And it can be viewed as the individual's sense of time and place. Now, Sigmund Freud thought that no one escaped childhood undamaged, basically that you would run into things that your mind didn't like or couldn't cope with, so it had these sort of defense mechanisms that would seek to pacify the id. The id is the child and doesn't like to feel bad. It doesn't like to feel less than. It doesn't like to feel hurt. So defense mechanisms are a way of coping with these negative emotions. And we can start with repression. This is the first defense mechanism that Freud discovered and is arguably the most important. Repression is an unconscious action that the ego takes in order to keep terrible and horrible, disturbing things from becoming part of our conscious thought. They remain hidden underneath. So these thoughts get repressed or pushed down into the sea of our subconscious remaining hidden because if they came to the surface, if they became conscious thought, they would cause anxiety and all sorts of traumatic, horrible, physical, and mental effects. However, some of those effects still come to the surface because those memories and thoughts still do exist in our subconscious, gently influencing our feelings rather than allowing us to remember the events themselves. The next defense mechanism is called projection, basically saying, I don't like something about myself, so I'm gonna deny its existence and its truth about me, but I'm going to point it out and how much I hate it in other people. Displacement is another defense mechanism, which is the redirection of an impulse. Basically, a good example of this would be, let's say you're at work and a boss starts yelling at you. Well, you can't yell back at your boss or else he'd fire you, but in order to deal with that negative pent up emotion, you're gonna go home and yell at your children or your wife, something that you can yell at without being fired. I'm not saying this is right or okay, but it happens. The next defense mechanism is sublimation, which is similar to displacement, but takes place when we manage to displace our emotions into a more constructive thing. This might be artistic, we might be painting or writing a song or building a new contraption or carving or dancing or something to deal with our frustrations in a way that does not get us fired and 
doesn't affect our wives and children like it would by yelling at them in displacement. Another defense mechanism, which is widely overused, is denial, but it is still a defense mechanism. Denial involves blocking some external events from awareness. Now, this isn't like repression where they're pushed into the subconscious. Denial is more of the conscious and logical decision to ignore these thoughts and feelings. But it's not quite as conscious or as logical as you might think. It almost happens automatically because the alternative is so traumatic and so horrible to the individual. Another defense mechanism is regression, which is taking a step back psychologically and physiologically when faced with stress. For example, if we got horribly injured and ended up in a hospital, people have been known to wet their beds because they're so scared. They kind of step back into a childlike mentality, or they might start sucking their thumb or wanting a blanket or something like this. It's a rather uncommon defense mechanism, but it's still something that Sigmund Freud theorized. And the last of the defense mechanisms is rationalization. Rationalization is the cognitive distortion of the facts, basically meaning that we're going to reconstruct our idea of reality so that it doesn't disagree with the things that happen. We often do this at a fairly conscious level and we provide ourselves with many excuses. Usually this comes from people with very, very hypersensitive egos making excuses so that they're never truly aware of it. It's sort of like lying to other people, but in a way that you actually believe your own lies. For instance, people who say, oh, I am not fat, I am just big boned. This is a form of rationalization to consciously and emotionally deal with the trauma of being overweight and unhealthy. And it's not just a lie they tell to other people so other people think about them differently. It's so that they can continue living their lives thinking the same thing and the same way about themselves because the alternative is too terrible. Like I said, a lot of Sigmund Freud's theories have been widely discredited like an Oedipus complex, but a lot of them, like defense mechanisms, exist in some form or another. And that's why Sigmund Freud is still considered the father of modern psychology. Thank you so much for watching today's episode of The Drawing Board. My name is David Franklin. I'm your host. And thank you so much for joining us for a 30-day Tesseract Dice YouTube campaign, where for 30 days we're talking about the science behind our Tesseract Dice on All right. And so here are um, some of the defense mechanisms that he was talking about. And um, it's absolutely correct. Uh, a lot of defense mechanisms we still look at even today in, in modern psychology, um, rationalization, um, you know, denial, although he does point out denial gets over, overused um, and, uh, and projection is, is, is another one. So this is, from your, um, this is from your book and it has some really good examples uh, on the other side, right? So for instance, projection, Chris often cheats on her boyfriend because she suspects he is already cheating on her. So that's engaging in a behavior. Um, I will also say that, that uh, a person can ex be experiencing defense mechanisms, but more than one at a time. So if Chris is cheating on her boyfriend because she suspects that he's cheating on her right? That would be projection. And then she also might use rationalization to justify her behavior. Well, he's doing it. Um, so it must be okay. I'm not doing anything wrong. He started it as an example. So a person could be using more than one defense mechanism at a time. So, all right. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to um, end on defense mechanisms and uh, so this will conclude uh, part one. Let's see. Oh, first, there's a question. Um, one, why do those things relate so closely to grief and loss? That's a great question. Uh, a person, uh, for instance, a person can be in denial, right? If we look at the stages of grief, right? The first stage is shock and, um, and denial. Um, that would be a defense mechanism because the trauma of the loss is, is difficult to bear. So a person may engage in, in that. Um, as far as any other defense mechanisms, I don't really see that as being um, uh, too connected with other grief reactions. It could be, you know, um, could be displacement, 
So the person is experiencing the grief and the loss and they're angry um, and they might take that out on another person. Um, I could see where that, that might, um, uh, might come up. I generally, me personally, don't think of defense mechanisms in that way with grief and loss, but uh, your question certainly makes um, a really good point. And um, yeah, and I could, I could see how some of that might, might be part of the grieving process, but it might be under bargaining, um, anger, uh, et cetera, right? So you have, yeah. All right, any, uh, any other questions before we go? All right, so we will pick up with part two of uh, chapter 11, personality on Wednesday. Don't go anywhere just yet. Stop the recording.